Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this month, staying in with TPS MTSU. We're really excited to have you join us today um, as we explore teaching with artifacts. Um, before we jump into our uh, topic for the month, though, just a couple of quick housekeeping notes. Um, as always, we record these for uh, inclusion on our YouTube channel. So uh, yeah, we'll just do our regular uh, to keep our sound quality good by keeping our mics muted. Um, and as always, we love for these to be interactive. So um, you know, if you didn't get a chance to join us live, we encourage you to do so. Um, so we can, uh, you can use that chat function there, uh, reaction buttons, and we occasionally do polling. Um, so that is one of the benefits to joining us live. Um, so as always with this series, um, we do have a Padlet uh, page set up where we've been including information uh, for the different sessions that we've been doing with Dan um, since we started this back in 2020. Um, so you can find that using the QR code here or the link. Um, and you can find not only resources for um, this particular session, but for all the previous sessions, as well as the link to the survey page um, if you want to complete that for PD credit. And we'll talk about that a little bit more at the end. So with our housekeeping things taken care of, I'm going to turn things over to my colleague, Stacy, um, to talk to us a little bit about our theme for this month. Great. Thank you, Kira. I'm going to share my screen so we can all look at the newsletter together. I'm going to make it a little bit larger. There we go. So that you can see it better, hopefully. We chose the theme Teaching with Artifacts, which we have done before, but we just felt like there were so many other opportunities and great ideas that we wanted to explore. And so that's why we chose it again. Um, if you want to see the previous issue, volume one, we have it linked from the theme blurb on page one. We also did an issue on teaching with artifacts, but that one is called material culture. So same thing, uh, but just using the slightly more academic sounding uh, name for using artifacts. And so base, I'm going to show you what these look like or remind you what they look like since many of you have probably already seen these before. So in April, 2018, we did material culture. And we tried not to duplicate uh, the same ideas and links uh, from these other issues, but some of the stuff is uh, the same, uh, you know, so you'll find that we link to the same flute collection in uh, two or three of these. So for instance, this uh, linked collection of flutes from the awesome source, it's actually the same flute collection that I'm going to be talking about a little bit later. Um, and so some of our important links in the important links box, they may overlap, but we try hard not to make that uh, entirely redundant. So you can always have new resources, even when we are doing themes that we've already done before. So in 2018, uh, we did a lesson idea on Mayan artifacts because there's a very big collection of pre-Columbian uh, American artifacts from the Jay Kislek collection at the Library of Congress. And there's also a lesson idea looking at the tractor uh, and what it can tell us about socioeconomics in the early 1900s. Um, there's a lesson idea on kids and consumerism and seeing as how we're coming up soon on Christmas season, this might be something that you have thought about more at this time of year. Uh, and then our featured feature was talking about our summer institute at that time. And then of course we have additional primary sources on page four. So our first one that we actually called Teaching with Artifacts was just one year ago in December 2021. And we link back again to the material culture issue that I just showed you. And in this one, you may recall, we looked at the Civil War portraits from the Lillian Quist family collection at the Library of Congress. Um, because even though a photograph is a 2D artifact, they often come with frames and other kinds of parts to them that make these very much uh, tangible objects and museum artifacts in their own right. 
Um, art, though, even 2D art is considered to be an artifact. Uh, so one of our lesson plans explores the art aspect by looking at Black history in murals, including several of them. Actually, maybe not several. I think there's might be one or two from Tennessee in there. Um, and the perennially popular What Was in Lincoln's Pockets, which is a feature that you will find in many places on the Library of Congress website. It's always interesting and engaging, especially for those younger students when you first teach them about the Civil War in, I believe, the fourth grade. And so this is, it has its own little video that goes with it. And it's, it's just a really good thing to use for young uh, students as well as eighth grade. Um, and then our final lesson idea was on the Edison light bulb, uh, which is that light bulb that has the visible filaments in it that's now kind of experiencing a resurgence in uh, trendy home goods stores. Uh, and so this is looking at that also in a kind of a socioeconomic context uh, and, and, and talking about that, bringing in some science standards as well. And then additional primary sources. But for this month, uh, we are going to be talking about um, all three of our news, uh, of our lesson ideas, just a little bit. Uh, but our featured feature, I will just uh, mention, uh, this um, is on the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, which was federal legislation from the year 1990 to help protect cultural artifacts belonging to Native American tribes. And so if that's an area that you're interested in, um, then this featured feature is for you. Uh, we're gonna talk about Lizzo playing James Madison's crystal flute soon. Uh, and we're gonna talk about this board game called the Mansion of Happiness, the Bayou Tapestry uh, for you world history teachers out there. Uh, and then of course we have additional things on page four. So I am going to throw it back to Kira to start us off. All right, I thought I had unmuted myself. All right, so thank you. Um, so I'm gonna to talk to you guys a little bit about the Mansion of Happiness. So let me actually pull up the image of this. All right, so we tried to come up with kind of an idea for what uh, I wanted to explore this month. I got to thinking about um, some of the things that we had seen uh, in years past when we used to do our annual meetings at the Library of Congress. I remember one year they showed us this children's board game. And so I started doing some searching in the Library of Congress, and I don't know that I ever found the one they showed us there, but I read across this one. And um, what it got me thinking about and why I thought that these might make an interesting lesson idea is when we think about artifacts, we often think about things we see in museums. So we think about, you know, important people's things. But what about the everyday objects that we use? And especially everyday objects that we use for entertainment. Um, and what can those objects tell us about life? Um, and so you might want to start, uh, you know, introducing an idea like this with your students by having them think about, you know, what artifact do they have that they might share with, you know, a future generation of people um, that would explain how they spent their leisure time. So for me, it would most likely one of them would be my tablet or my phone, right? Because um, unfortunately, this is how most of us entertain ourselves these days. Um, so with both of these, though, we could think about some questions that would we would ask. And one of them is, you know, what technology advances uh, were needed in order to create these items um, that we use to entertain ourselves. Um, also, what do they tell us about the culture um, at the time that they were being used, uh, again, for whatever entertainment value they might have? Um, they can also tell us some about, of course, economics. They might tell us some about religious life um, and just, you know, the culture more broadly. Um, and so it's kind of a good series of questions to kind of again introduce the idea of, you know, uh, exploring uh, entertainment objects and entertainment artifacts with your students. 
So for this one in particular, um, you know, you could begin by showing your students uh, an image of this board game like you see here in front of you. Um, and I have downloaded the TIFF version of this from the Library of Congress website. So you can really, we're gonna zoom in so we can actually be able to tell some detail on the, the spaces and the game itself. Um, so before we kind of talk about the background of this, let's just do a little looking and figuring out some questions that we might ask. So we might want to start with just asking students, you know, what is this made of, right? Um, can we tell by looking at it? Uh, what technology would have been needed to create this? Um, so, you know, right off, we know that we're going to need to be able to print things. We're going to be able to print things in color. We're going to need the material in which we are printing this game on, and it's going to need to be some kind of material that is, you know, sturdy enough that it can be used multiple times, uh, you know, stored, brought back out, you know, so again, you know, is it cardboard, you know, what kind of material are we talking about here? Um, what implements do you need to, to play the game? Um, and, you know, again, just kind of some basic questions about, you know, what it is that we see when we look at this um, and having them think about again, what, you know, what can we tell? So, you know, they might notice um, here at the top of it, uh, the title for this, The Mansion of Happiness, an instructive, moral and entertaining amusement. Uh, and then, you know, if we look at the spaces, uh, we see we start out with, you know, we see justice and piety, honesty, water, audacity, uh, humility, the stocks, um, industry, a perjurer. Um, now, some of these words you may have to help students kind of get figure out what uh, you know what we mean by some of these words. Uh, we see temperance there, gratitude, um, summit of dispensation. Uh, that's probably a great one you'd want to explain to students. Um, so again, you know, we could really kind of give them a chance to explore this and think about again how this game might be played. And once they've had a chance to, again, explore those questions, uh, you know, think about the, again, our basic primary source analysis question, right? What do we see? What do we know? And what do we wonder? Um, and after you've had a chance to go through that, you can begin to kind of introduce some background um, about this particular game. Now, this is one of the first published games in the United States when it was published in 1843. It actually dates earlier than that, though. Um, back, it was actually originally published in Great Britain. Um, in the earlier 1800s. Uh, it was designed by a man named uh, George Fox um, and sold out pretty immediately with the first three editions that were published. Um, so he wanted people to know for sure what his game was about, which is why we have the various obvious title of Mansion of Happiness, uh, you know, instruct instructive, moral, and entertaining. Uh, and again, with that emphasis on morality. Um, so the game's design elements conveyed this concern for, you know, pure and Puritan uh, family entertainment. Uh, and again, you could, we'll see that emphasized when we look at the spaces a little more. Um, so the game came with a spinning numbered top um, rather than a dice, which, you know, you might ask your students why it would come with a top and not a dice at the time. Uh, and of course, that was because uh, they believed dice was bad because it would lead to gambling and therefore was, you know, of the devil. Uh, so the storyline for the game is that players uh, are on a journey, which they are buffeted between virtue and vice as they travel towards the mansion of happiness there in the center. Uh, it is the heavenly destination for the pure and pious. Players who land on board spaces with illustrations of particular Christian virtues are considered to possess them um, and are rewarded as follows. Uh, so one example, whoever possesses piety, honesty, temperance, gratitude, prudence, truth, chastity, sincerity, humility, industry, charity, humanity, or generosity is entitled to advance six numbers towards the mansion of happiness. But of course, there are consequences if you land on the spaces that are, de uh, that are for specific sins. So for those, for example, whoever possesses audacity, cruelty, immodesty, or ingratitude must return to their former situation till his turn comes to spin again and not even think of happiness, much less partake of it. Um, and then, of course, it does recommend some compassion. So, for example, poverty, the whipping post, the house of correction, the pillory, the stocks, prison, and ruin are to be considered as blanks in your progress to the mansion. Uh, so, 
you also had a chance, of course, uh, if you landed on idleness, um, then you had to go back to poverty. So again, we, you know, some very definite uh, moral uh, lessons to be taught here um, with this game. Um, and if you have students or if you yourself are a fan of Pride and Prejudice, you might note that there are some similarities, I believe, to one of the games that they create in that story. Um, so again, you can begin to see the, the impact on popular culture at the time. So, uh, you know, we could think about, you know, now that we know a little background on the, the game itself, think about again what this game tells us about the time that it was created and when it was popular. Um, so again, thinking about, you know, what does this tell us about religious life at the time? Knowing that this is happening around the time of the Industrial Revolution, um, again, when people maybe have a little bit more leisure time, uh, what does that tell us, especially for those, uh, you know, who, who are maybe a little bit more well off and could afford to purchase games like this. Um, so again, we can really think about the, the time and the culture in which that it was created. You might also want to have students compare this to some other later board games. Uh, so you can kind of compare that, that change over time and again what these games can tell us about uh, life uh, in the United States as we move forward. Um, so another game, uh, and let me pull it up and I'll show you what it looks like. Um, I've got one too many things here open on my... This is the one I want. So one of the other games is called the Checkered Game of Life. Uh, and so this is one that's created a little bit later that's sort of modeled after Mansions of Happiness, um, still has a kind of moral tale to it, but is also one um, that kind of is more in line with uh, the, the time period in that uh, there are things that are secular that are included that aren't necessarily uh, just designated as sin. Right. Um, so you can see, compare like the different, uh, you know, um, spaces that are included here. Um, so again, this is one that you can do a comparison. And I included a link to where you can find this one, I believe. Um, and for some reason, the little black bar is blocking. I cannot see uh, where this is coming from. Oh, it's the uh, New York uh, History uh, Museum. So New York Historical Society is where you can find um, this one. Another game that you can use as a point of comparison that may be very, very familiar to your students, of course, is the game of Monopoly. Um, very, very popular, right? Everybody's played Monopoly at least once, um, probably got mad and thrown the board, right? Uh, and so again, similar in that, you know, we we, we're on a quest, right? Uh, we are uh, collecting things that are supposed to make us, you know, theoretically happy. Of course, Monopoly being more that you are collecting things uh, in line with capitalism. Um, so, again, you can do this comparison again, what does Monopoly um, tell us about the time that it was created, um, again, early, I think it's created in the early 20th century, I believe, um, as opposed to what, uh, you know, Mansions of Happiness uh, and what it tells us about the time it was created. Um, if you're interested in learning more, uh, a little bit of background about, you know, the history of games, um, I listened to a really fascinating podcast a while back. Uh, called Now and Then. There's an episode where they talk about uh, the history of games and they bring up, um, they mention Mansions of Happiness, they talk about Checker Game of Life um, and some of the others. And again, this bigger question about what do these games tell us about life in America at the time that they were created and, and were popular. Um, so I definitely would suggest checking that out um, if you're interested in learning more. So hopefully this will give you some ideas about, you know, a fun way that you could, uh, again, talk about the Industrial Revolution, talk about the impact of Puritanism um, in America using an artifact like a children's board game. So I'm going to turn things back over to Stacy to talk to us maybe about Lizzo and the Crystal Flute. Thank you. Um, I am going to share my screen again and take us to that particular portion of the newsletter. And I'm gonna make this a little bigger. There we go. So uh, I'm guessing that some of you have heard about this, that Lizzo, uh, went to the Library of Congress and played a very, very rare crystal flute that it belonged to James Madison. 
And she even got to play it for about half a minute on stage at one of her concerts in Washington, DC. And there, there were a lot of reactions that were, um, that ranged from the very positive to, of course, the very negative because Twitter brings that out in our society. Um, but I am going to tell you what exactly happened because uh, this is a Library of Congress story and it is pretty much because uh, Carla Hayden, the Librarian of Congress, knew that Lizzo was a trained uh, concert flutist at, or flautist. And uh, she invited her to come to the Library of Congress to see their flute collection because the Library of Congress, surprisingly enough, has one of the largest flute collections in the world. Who knew? Uh, the reason that the Library of Congress has some random collections of some things and not other things, of course, has to do with the process of accession and donations that happens at museums anywhere in the world where sometimes they will get a donation from um, a wealthy benefactor or a collector uh, who has concentrated on one thing in particular. So if I click on this fluke collection link, you'll see that that is what happened. And this is why the Library of Congress has an incredible amount of rare flutes. And this is um, the collection of a, a man named Dayton Miller. And he uh, collected nearly 1,700 flutes and other wind instruments, as well as a lot of documents uh, that you can see here actually that show the flute in society and its role as part of popular culture as well as elite culture and vernacular culture and the way it's used in art. Um, so it's, it's a really neat collection for that. Uh, and so if you want to know more about that, if you're very interested in teaching using the history of music or musical instruments. This is something that a lot of your students might be familiar with because a lot of them, I'm sure, play musical instruments. And the Library of Congress happens to have a lot, and not just flutes, but they also have a collection of Stradivarius violins and some other kinds of uh, stringed instruments. Um, and so I'm going back here. And they have had different people come and play these uh, because they also hold con concerts at the library. So for example, Yo-Yo Ma has gone to the Library of Congress and played one of their Stradivarius cellos there before. And of course, nobody, nobody put up a fuss when Yo-Yo Ma played a Stradivarius um, at the Library of Congress because, I mean, he's Yo-Yo Ma. He's, he's just one of the best human beings on the planet. He can do anything. Uh, but, uh, but yes, uh, so it's interesting to contrast uh, the library's long history of letting people come in and play its musical instruments versus what happened here with Lizzo and why this is a different way of presenting a historical instrument in the context of 2022 popular culture. Aside. So... The basic source for this is a blog article called, It's About Dang Time, Lizzo at the Library. And this is a really great blog article because it has wonderful pictures from her visit. And it also explains the whole thing that and the chronological order that it happened and kind of why Lizzo ended up there. Um, and how excited she was uh, at the invitation saying, I'm coming Carla and I'm playing that crystal flute. And this was a Twitter conversation. <laughs> and so um, she was in Washington DC for a concert and they she got this tour in this um, collection uh, behind the scenes and she got to play some of it. And so here is an image of her holding this crystal flute. 
Now this crystal flute has a, a really great story of its own. It was made by a very famous lute maker in Paris, France named Claude Laurent. And he kind of pioneered this way of making glass flutes at the end of the 18th, early 19th centuries. And he made um, somewhere between one and 200 of them were, uh, yes. And, uh, but then uh, it's because they, they seemed to withstand certain kinds of conditions better than ivory flutes or uh, wooden flutes, which is what the materials had been before. But then in the 19th century, the, the metal came to be used in the making of flutes and that kind of took over. And so flutes after that point would be made of metal and there weren't gonna be any more glass flutes. So it's also an interesting way to talk about how materials can affect the way that instruments uh, sound, the way that they're made, the way that they can be more affordable to a larger portion of the population. Uh, what are instruments made of today? Have they always been made that way? Um, I know that my daughter has a recorder that's made out of plastic. It is nowhere near this nice, but then she doesn't play anywhere near as nice as Lizzo. So there's that. Um, so uh, lots of questions. And one thing uh, is a basic kind of primary source analysis, but how do you analyze artifacts uh, kind of lesson idea. And so the Library of Congress in its page of primary source analysis tools doesn't actually have a teacher's guide that's specifically geared towards 3D objects. And so I actually link to one from the National Archives instead. And so this is kind of a basic analysis process that you could use with beginning students uh, you know, students who haven't analyzed um, artifacts before at all. Uh, these are just some very basic questions. And talking about materials, observing its parts. I love this question. Describe it as if you were explaining it to someone who can't see it. I think that's a really great exercise. And of course, students are just going to want to say flute. But then uh, if you if you kind of play a game with them and say, okay, there are some words you're not allowed to say. One is flute. Now, how do you describe it? Uh, and really challenge them to observe features and shapes and materials. And I know that they can't pick up any of these flutes that are at the Library of Congress uh, to talk about their weight and kind of how they feel, but you can get a lot of the other features from looking at the images and also looking at some of the videos and then trying to make sense of it. You know, where is it from? Who used it? And that's where um, both that blog article that I linked to, plus another one that I'll show you in a second, will give you the information for doing that. And then the last step, use it as historical evidence, which of course is what we want students to do with primary sources. So if they start thinking about, oh, this flute is a primary source, but what is it a primary source for? And so um, asking them questions about that. So that is uh, kind of the, um, the main analysis portion of this lesson. And so the other blog article that I mentioned in here is about its connection to James Madison. Because if you look at the flute, here's another picture of this flute. And it talks about Claude Laurent, the flute maker, too, a, a little bit. And if you zoom in, uh, and you, it also has it on this one, too. This is actually a larger one. You can see how it's engraved in one of the metal bands on there um, to James Madison. Um, and it has the year. Uh, that he was made as president of the United States in French, and it has the year 1813. And so you can ask, ask students, okay, well, this means this was at the White House in the year 1813. What happened to the White House in the year 1814? And hopefully some of your fourth or eighth graders who have been paying attention will be able to say, the British burnt the White House. 
and Dolly Madison saved the portrait of George Washington. Well, she also saved some other things too. And so uh, this, I can't get to it. Hold on, I, I'm, I'm having trouble uh, accessing some of my tabs. Um, I have to wait for my black box to go away. But uh, the, so the, I'm just gonna go there through here. So this other, I can't get to it. Okay, hang on. All right, the mystery of James Madison's crystal flute. Uh, this is the blog article that talks about whether or not Dolly Madison um, may have saved this flute when she was also saving some other pieces. Uh, and they can't prove it. Uh, they don't know for certain. Um, it's saying that Madison was known to appreciate fine European goods. Uh, so that would make it seem like, yeah, she would have grabbed this. Um, and so they're trying to trace through other kinds of primary sources if they mentioned the flute later. And so it is back in Washington, according to a letter from 1842. Uh, but unfortunately, we don't have enough evidence to prove that it was part of whatever she took with her, but somehow it must have been saved, right? So because it exists and it wasn't uh, destroyed in the fire. So that might be a, a really cool kind of uh, question to pose to students. Um, so it's got that wonderful connection to one of our founding fathers. It has a connection to this major event in US early history. And then of course it has this wonderful connection to a pop artist that students probably are familiar with today. And um, even I have heard of Lizzo, so, and I live under a rock. So um, I, I was really excited to learn more about her experience there. And um, I will say that, ugh, sorry, I cannot get this black bar to go away. And that means I can't access. Hold on, I'm trying to get to it. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. Um, if you can see, I just, um, there was a whole Twitter thread with a hashtag Lizzo at LOC. Because this started out as a Twitter conversation between the Librarian of Congress, Carla Hayden, and Lizzo, um, this is also where a lot of the related posts of her visit were first posted before they were written into a blog later and put on the library's website. So if you're on Twitter and you wanna know more about the story and what other people posted about it as well, um, then this is a good place to go. And it also has where Carla Hayden retweets the footage from Lizzo's concert um, of her playing for that, you know, 30 seconds on that flute. And a lot of people were, were like, how is it that she got to play this priceless artifact on stage during a pop concert? Is that appropriate? And um, so the blog article explains the level of care and security that were involved in that and how it was uh, totally above the board uh, kind of action uh, between the Library of Congress and this, you know, pop artist and how the positive attention she brought both to the Library of Congress and to historical artifacts was probably on a scale that a, this flute certainly has never experienced before in its lifetime. And maybe no other artifact that the Library of Congress in recent memory has experienced either. And so, you know, you might ask your students, okay, well, what does it mean that a, a young black female pop artist is playing a flute that was owned by one of our slave holding founding fathers? And what does that say about our society? She is genuinely excited to be playing this flute uh, and her love for the history of it uh, certainly comes out. 
And so I know that you were all waiting to see a clip of her playing. So I'm going to play it. Now, I can't play the one from her concert, um, but I can play what the Library of Congress has posted to its website. And so I am going to do that. Uh, and first, I have to share my sound. Okay. So this is just a 55 second clip. Uh, she plays a little bit on the famous crystal flute. And then I believe she plays more uh, later on a different flute. But I think this uh, segment right here is just her playing the crystal flute. Inside the amazing looking atrium of the Jefferson building, which is one of the three buildings of the Library of Congress. Yeah, but once it was actually construction began, the Army Corps of Engineers built it. So they came in on time and under budget, which never happens. <laughs> Okay, so you want to play that for your students and see what they can tell you about her performance there. Obviously, uh, if you're trained in music um, or you like listening to music, you can tell that she is classically trained by the way that she plays, the way she can trill, and kind of have them also listen to the tone of the flute. What does it sound like? Can they hear the echo inside that big room? And maybe have them watch it once with their eyes and then listen to it once with their ears and uh, kind of get, uh, just generate more discussion about what's, you know, what do you do with historic instruments that are in storage in museums and in other kinds of repositories? Should you be playing them? Uh, are they meant to be played? And is it good for them to be played? And um, a lot of musicians will come down on the side of, yes, you should play instruments because it helps keep them in shape. In fact, the it depends on the instrument, of course, but the Stradivarius collection was actually donated with the stipulation that those were played from time to time. And so, you know, maybe it's a good thing that this doesn't just stay in a box for its entire lifetime and that it's actually brought out and played because that's what you're supposed to do with a musical instrument. So there are all sorts of kinds of um, directions that you can take this discussion in uh, that is part of the analysis of this artifact because uh, not only is it something that you can see and touch, but it's something you can hear, uh, which gives it another dimension that a lot of the artifacts on the Library of Congress just don't have. You know, you're looking at statues and you know, they don't make sounds. Um, so uh, that's kind of, that's kind of uh, what's wrapped up inside this uh, lesson idea right here. And so I do want to spend our last bit of time before we get to the resources section, just walking you through very quickly um, another, uh, our third lesson idea for this issue. Uh, which is also based on a blog, blog article that was uh, written. Because of course the Bayou Tapestry, which is this incredibly famous tapestry, of course, recording the Battle of Hastings, which took place in the 11th century in England. So this is why it's for you medieval history teachers out there. This is not an item that the Library of Congress has. It's not one of its artifacts. Uh, that would, no. So uh, why can we talk about the Bayou Tapestry at the Library of Congress? It's because they have this really cool blog article 
that was marking the anniversary of the Battle of Hastings. And so uh, this anniversary happened less than a month ago on October the 14th. And uh, this is, of course, William the Conqueror invading uh, southern England and taking over from the Anglo-Saxon kings and beginning the Norman dynasty. And this was a really big turning point in medieval England, as well as medieval Europe in general. And it really kind of reinforced these ties between southern England and France. And so, um, and this, this tapestry is just an amazing work of art, which I think a lot of you are already familiar with. Um, but there was, uh, there's a fold out book of the Bayou tapestry uh, that has these wonderful little captions that are um, talking in three languages about what's going on in the scene depicted above. So they have them in French, English, and German. Uh, so basically this is some librarians having fun and taking pictures uh, from this Bayou Tapestry foldout book. And here we have them. And so why not use these uh, in a lesson? Uh, you have these you know, wonderful pictures, uh, and of the, the ships, uh, this fantastic picture where Harold receives the orb and scepter. Here's the orb and here's the scepter. These are of course the symbols of kingship um, and that Harold being the last uh, Anglo-Saxon king um, and Rex right here is a, the Latin word for king. And here's the word Harold. And so it's a great work of medieval art. And this, uh, this lesson idea also brings in a, an analysis process that we have had posted on our website for quite a while. It's on our tools page, uh, but it's a page, um, it's a tool called 25 questions to ask your primary source. And this is one that we don't bring out all that often, but it's, a, it's an oldie, but it's still a goodie. Uh, so these are the what, when, where, who, why questions, plus how many, which, and then of course, prompting students to think of even more questions that you can ask about primary sources. So even though this isn't kind of a graphic organizer for students to fill in, this is a really great discussion prompter, uh, forcing students to think from a lot of different angles uh, and realize that you know just looking at something and saying what it is is not enough. Uh, there's so many things that you can ask and, and maybe even answer uh, when looking at a primary source, even one like the Bayou Tapestry. And so that's uh, going to be our world history contribution because we're trying uh, to make more materials. This was done by our graduate research assistant, Abby Highcade, who has a background in teaching world history. And so she's trying very hard to comb the Library of Congress for what it has available for those of you who do teach in the world history curriculum. I'm gonna throw it back to Kira for a resources section now. So I'm gonna stop sharing. All right, thank you, Stacey. Um, and so in my uh, podcast uh, suggestions, uh, there's also a now and then episode talks about Lizzo and the uh, the flute and has a little bit of background about the, uh, the flute. One thing they mentioned that I thought was interesting about that uh, is they mentioned that, uh, you know, with a lot of the, you know, historic flutes that they're keyed differently they're fingered differently uh and so like just how impressive is that she could play something that again is not at all like a modern flute would be um so i was like oh who knew things i didn't know about flutes um all right so resources um as uh Stacey mentioned at the beginning we like to be able to share um some different links for things um outside of the library of congress uh, oftentimes uh on page two so there are a few things here that I want to mention um, that may be useful to you. Um, first off, uh, if you've not had a chance to see our uh, World War II Homefront in Tennessee curriculum, uh, we do have an activity in there in the Tennesseans at War Unit um, on use, that uses artifacts. Um, and this is one that I uh, particularly like. Um, let's see here, I should have brought this up before. Um, so working with the State Museum, uh, we were able to get a digital copy of several different items that are not on display 
um, there at the museum. Um, so let's see, let me. This is one of the last activities in this particular unit. Um, all right, Stacy, are you seeing the? Uh, okay, make sure that my screen was sharing the right thing. All right, so what this activity is, um, is this looks at a collection of uh, artifacts that belong to a soldier from East Tennessee near the Knoxville area. Um, and so the name of this is using artifacts to tell a story of Tennessee and Okinawa. Um, and so you'll see within this activity that there are, of course, the directions, the curriculum standards that it can hit. Um, there is a PowerPoint presentation that you can use where all of the different artifacts are set into the PowerPoint. So again, you could show them and have students analyze the, um, the different objects. Um, and then there's this uh, prompt piece that you can use. Again, kind of thinks about, talks about kind of each artifact that we have and uh, some prompts for discussion. So kind of even starting out with an image um, of Private Floyd Sharp, who um, is the person that all these objects belong to, um, looking at again, his, um, you know, his letterman's jacket. Uh, he was a high school athlete. Uh, who played football um, before he uh, enlisted and uh, went to fight in World War II. Um, there's an artifact that shows uh, a map of the, uh, the one of the camps that he was trained in, uh, as well as an image uh, of one, uh, one of the other places that he went as well uh, for his training prior to being um, sent over. Um, there is a copy of a V-mail. So this is sort of uh, you know, one of the letters that was sent home to his family uh, in their correspondence. Um, a image of the Purple Heart that he received and an image of the telegram where his family was informed that he had been killed in battle. Um, and then finally ends with an image from the Library of Congress um, that is from one of the, uh, the VJ Day parades. Um, and of course, the, the tragedy, one of the real tragedies um, of this story is that he, uh, you know, he perishes really just uh, shortly before um, the war is ended um, there in the, the, in the Japan, in that area. Um, so, uh, you know, this is again, an activity where again, you can use these artifacts to tell the story and help to draw a personal connection uh, for students to, uh, you know, to another Tennessean when you're talking about World War II. Um, so that is linked there at the beginning. Um, and of course, when we talk about teaching art with artifacts, um, you know, museums, of course, do this all the time. This is, uh, you know, the crux of what they do. And so we wanted to link to several of our museum partners across the state who have some great resources available for you. Um, we link to the East Tennessee um, Historical Society's Teach Teen History page. Um, they have a, uh, what their lesson, um, let's see, these uh, artifact lessons that they have are all designed around these artifact cards, and they have them for different units. Um, this is just one that they have that is on the early uh, Tennessee history period, and so what you'll find with each of these is that each of the cards um, features one item that is in their museum and in their collections, um, and then gives you a little bit of background about it, gives you some questions that you could ask students um, and so, again, you can go through these and kind of see, uh, you know, again, what some of these are. So we've got, you know, the basket, the trade beads. Um, you'll see that there is vocabulary listed within here. Um, here we have a canon. Um, you know, so again, these can be very, um, you know, useful, again, to kind of, again, highlight some of the objects that they have there. But again, if you can't get to the museum, you can use these object cards to create some very interesting lessons for your students. Um, the Tennessee State Museum, of course, has their very popular traveling trunks program, and we link to that here. Um, if you're not familiar with it, um, they do have uh, trunks for a variety of topics that you can have sent out to your school uh, for no charge. I believe there is uh, a charge to, uh, to return it, um, but you don't have to get charged to have it sent out to you. Um, so you can find more information there at that link. Um, and then sort of similar, the uh, Memphis Museum of Science and History, formerly known as the Pink Palace Museum, uh, it there has a passport program that's sort of similar to the traveling trunks. Um, many of these have more of a science uh, angle to them, but they do have a few history ones that are artifact based. And so um, you can check those out. Now with those, they do, I noticed on their website, they do only send those out uh, to kind of Shelby County and the surrounding area. So you have to be in West Tennessee to make use of that program. Um, the Tennessee State Museum, those are available to all Tennessee teachers. 
Um, and then I note a couple of other um, different lesson plans that I found. Uh, there's one from the Library of Congress, Primary Sources and Personal Artifacts. Um, and then this personal artifacts activity from the Penn State University Center for Teaching Excellence. Both of these are sort of similar in that they are um, uh, basically outlines for how you can create a lesson plan um, using having students bring in artifacts for their own life and kind of teaching them how to analyze those artifacts to again pull information. And so this is a great way to again introduce the idea of teaching with artifacts um, again with something that they can actually bring into the into your classroom and touch and feel because. Unfortunately, with museum artifacts, you know, they're not going to be able to, uh, to handle uh, many of those. But with this, that way you actually get that tactile experience. So like Jose's talking about how does something, how much does it weigh and those kind of things, you know, you can answer those questions with, um, with personal items that maybe students have brought in. So definitely check out both of those if you're interested in uh, doing those kind of lessons. Uh, both of those I thought were particularly good um, outlines for how to do that. The other, um, resource that we found uh, is this Teaching the Village with Artifacts uh, lesson plan from the Fort Vancouver National Historic Site. Um, so again, this is the West Coast, um, but I thought this one was really interesting, uh, one for how comprehensive that it is. Um, so if you're teaching the Pacific Northwest, you could definitely, uh, you know, use this um, as it is, but even if you're not, you can look at how some of these are structured and some of the graphic organizers that they include um, in this uh, curriculum uh, and probably adapt it for um, content within your own standards. Um, but you'll see how it's set up that there is a historical background and it talks about this particular site. Um, it talks about, you know, what do our household goods and personal belongings tell about us? So again, some basic questions again can apply to, to any site beyond just this particular one. Uh, you know, thinking about writings and maps and how do they change our ideas about who lived uh, at this particular location. Uh, then they go through an activity about what the household goods and the personal belongings tell about the people who live there. How do we interpret those objects? I particularly like that part of this lesson. I thought that was really cool. Um, and then there is one about whose house is this. So you have to kind of determine like, you know, what we can figure out about the people who lived in these particular places by the objects found at the spot. Um, and then whose objects are they? Um, and so again, this is just a really fascinating curriculum, again, using artifacts that um, you can modify and use in different ways. Um, and you can see as you kind of scroll through here um, that there are, so you see they've got the graphic organizers here and then uh, as you get down in here, they actually have um, some nice images that you can use of the artifacts that they have featured within the curriculum itself. So again, it's a really cool resource. Uh, you know, Asian Pacific Northwest, I would highly recommend making use of that. Um, so those are the items that we feature there on page two. Um, and something else that is, is actually just happened this week um, that I want to bring your attention to um, with the Discover Tennessee History webinar series, um, this month's presentation was by the Tennessee State Museum, and they did their presentation on Tennessee's First Peoples um, and went through looking at some of the artifacts that they have in the museum exhibits uh, for that section um, and really kind of exploring like how you can use those artifacts uh, to learn about uh, the original inhabitants um, of this, this region in the state. Um, so it's a really great webinar, very fascinating. I know I learned a lot watching it. So if you're interested in checking that out, um, it is available on our YouTube channel. There's a whole uh, uh, listing there for the Discover Tennessee History uh, webinars that we've done. Um, so definitely uh, check that out. So with that, um, that brings us to the conclusion of our webinar for today. Unless Stacey, you can think of anything I have forgotten. Nope, I think that's good. All right, so I'll go back and actually add a link on the Padlet to that uh, to the presentation that the State Museum did this week. Because, like I said, it was really fascinating. If you teach that early period, uh, I highly recommend taking a look at it. Um, even if you can't get uh, your students to the museum, you could definitely use portions um, of that webinar with your kids to to talk about again Tennessee's first peoples. Um, so we'll add a link to that uh, to that to the Padlet here. Um, so definitely check that out. 
Um, and as always, of course, we uh, invite your feedback. And if you're interested in getting PD credit for uh, attending today's webinar or for watching this recording, um, you can either use the QR code here or type in the website address that, we, that you'll see here. Um, fill out that survey and then we send out those PD certificates about once a week. Um, so definitely check that out. Uh, we will be back next month on the second Thursday of the month, and our topic for next month is history through so or history through songs, right? Yeah. Um, so definitely join us if you are interested in that. And thank you guys so much. Have a great day.